I was speaking to uh, Mona Almeri about how the evolution has uh, gathered pace here at the World Government Summit. Last night on air for CNN, we were doing the show with Becky out here in the uh, foreground and the courtyard. Uh, we were suggesting it's the equivalent of the Middle Eastern Davos. I think it's a very fair comment, bringing together thought leaders uh, on the most important subjects of today. Now, as the moderator on this track, uh, 75 minutes that we have together today, I was thinking, how do I put everybody under one umbrella? And I'm sorry to overuse this word, but it's radical, right? So we're going to have a discussion about radical innovation and entrepreneurs from Kathleen Kennedy. Radical curiosity, which I think is going to spark your interest to round out our three sessions this morning with Paul Bennett of uh, IDEO or DEO. And it would be very lazy for me to suggest it would be about radical Islam in our first conversation. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. It's about tolerance in the 21st century, which has been a challenge. Uh, for those, and I think everybody in the room attended uh, the session with His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid uh, Al Maktoum, which was, I described on air last night as almost a fireside chat, reminded me of the period between 1930s and 1940s for those who have studied American history with uh, FDR and his radio broadcast at night. It was an open arena taking questions from out the, the Middle East and North Africa and asking the question, why? If we have a market of better than 300 million consumers, uh, why isn't the whole region doing much better? And despite the uncertainty we see in this neighborhood today, uh, is this region ready to reboot and take advantage of the next stage of growth as a bridge between uh, East and West? Our first topic of conversation is probably the most important uh, that we're witnessing in the region today, and I would argue that uh, res resonates throughout the world, and that is the, the stream of radicalism, the stream of populism that we see in the United States and Europe today, and even populism in terms of the legislation that's coming out in the early days of the Trump administration. Uh, let's welcome to the stage for a 20-minute conversation. I, I don't think we'll have time for Q&A in the first session. Let's see how it goes. Uh, but in our second session with Kathleen Kennedy, we want to be able to do that as well. We have two excellent guests to discuss this subject. Uh, let's uh, first welcome the first minister of tolerance anywhere in the world today, uh, a person who's worn many hats in this, uh, the governments in the past from foreign trade now to tolerance, uh, Her Excellency Sheikha Lubna al Qasimi, who's going to sit in the center of the stage. And the ambassador uh, to Russia for the UAE, uh, an Arab Russian. So I think it's very interesting to be able to talk about uh, Islam today in the context of what's taken place in Russia and the broader Mis Middle East and North Africa, who's recently put out a book that we're going to talk about that addresses this very subject. Let's give a warm welcome to Ambassador Omar Gabash, the UAE ambassador to Russia. So this is a track conversation, as we call it. So that means we have to stay on track because we have 20 minutes together. So no long answers. I don't mean that with the greatest warmth and attendance. <laughs> I think long. I've done about 20 <laughs> sessions with you over the last few years uh, alone. But it's the focus on tolerance, which is a key priority. You come from very different uh, approaches to this. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you suggest and our conversation we had yesterday as the Minister of Tolerance, that when you go abroad, people are suggesting, oh, why do we need a cabinet position with the Minister of Tolerance? Why does the UAE need a Minister of Happiness? Isn't uh, happiness like it is in the United States built into the Constitution? Do you really need to have a, a ministry for it? But you make a very interesting link, uh, Sheikh Lubna, and that is uh, if you have a tolerant society and you want to welcome the best minds to the UAE and to the Middle East and North Africa to address the Arab rejuvenation that Sheikh Mohammed was talking about yesterday, why is it important to declare tolerance as a cabinet position and what do you do with it? Right. Um, let me backtrack first. Some people look at values that they are inherent, inherent at something uh, we take with us from our community, from our society, we take it from our parents, and we take it for granted. But um, if you look at the formula within the UAE, it's a little bit different. Um, UAE started as a country with wealth, small nation and oil. And going forward, first priority was educating the nation. Second priority was to establish economy. And when you talk about economy, you're talking about diversification. So going into diversification where eventually you celebrate the last barrel of oil, 
um, um, uh, rather than uh, be dependent on it. Um, you create that by inviting the minds, the best minds of people, the best investors from abroad. So what makes the society tick? What makes it a welcoming society? First and, and uh, foremost, the nucleus or the core of this is the values itself where you encourage other people to come in. So if I want someone to uh, live in my society, I have to secure good education for the children. I have to uh, make sure that the lifestyle for the, for the wives is, is acceptable and it's something that very consistent with their own. Otherwise, the family would leave. They will not stay here. But even to sustain two generations of the family here as investors and businessmen, you need to create an environment that even their worshiping is incorporated. Hmm. So in the UAE, it's a Muslim um, country, but we have over two, 200 nationalities here. We have over 120 churches in the UAE. Dubai alone has 71. So when, when you want to respect nations living in here, you have to provide for it. Otherwise, it will not be secure enough for them to sustain this. So for us, it's inherent within our system. But in this day and age, and what was happening around us in the Middle East, but also worldwide, I think we take these values for granted. We heard uh, Schwab yesterday at the, at the opening, where he said, unfortunately today, even values are changing. In other words, the, the changes that we talk about politically or economically or environment, um, technology, all this disruptive environment that we live in. He said the constant that was in there, the values themselves, even these have become um, a change at the moment. Mm. So why um, we would leave something um, for uh, fate to take place? We need to make sure that we institutionalize tolerance. We need to make sure it's in our system. And we look at it from the grassroots. We look at it from cohesive families. Families. We'll look at it from youth. Youth today, and have you seen through the summit, are the core heart of everything that we do. Mm. We are entrusted as government officials with a legacy going forward that we need to secure a good future. And you have to do that with keeping um, kids and youth in mind, because today, although they can sit amongst us, but they are isolated. They live in a world of their own. They could be sitting in a, in a living room with you, but their world is totally different. Mm. And therefore, the uh, vulnerability of influence radicalization can actually hit them in their house while you're not aware of it as parents. So that's why this is a very important core um, uh, part of the cabinet for the UAE. Great. I'm going to come back on a number of different issues uh, thereafter. In your trip to Washington recently to the, uh, the religious breakfast or the gathering of of uh, uh, ministries uh, and the rest, you know, the national prayer, prayer breakfast, breakfast, which was quite an entertaining breakfast this time around with our new president, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, <laughs> can I say that? I think I can say that. <laughs> Everything's entertaining, exactly. And we changed our name, by the way, as a network. It's FNN, but no, it's not, not CNN, <laughs> the fake new, news network. <laughs> I don't know how that could ever have happened. When I started as an intern in 1984, we used to call it the Chicken Noodle Network. <laughs> <laughs> then it came the nice Cable there. News Network, then the FNN. We just dispelled that very quickly. That didn't hold at all. Uh, let's bring in the ambassador. And I think we should uh, address the kind of giant elephant in the room. And I thought His Highness Sheikh Mohammed yesterday, his discussion was very, very bold in a number of different issues. And in fact, on air, when we did the program with my colleague Becky, we talked about the discussion that he had addressing corruption, uh, addressing the fact we don't have enough Olympic uh, gold medals in the Middle East and North Africa, not enough patents in the Middle East and North Africa. And he said, how could we accept as a population uh, to use radical Islam, use Islam in the name of terrorism and the link that we've seen in different parts uh, of the world today? Uh, you've written a book addressing radicalism today. Uh, first, Ambassador, what did you take from the speech from Sheikh Mohammed? And, and number two, how do you, what's your interpretation of how uh, radicalism is linked so closely with Islam in many parts of the world or with the radical elements of the world, to put it uh, bluntly? Well, I've been taught that uh, on, can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. I've been taught on, on occasions like this to listen to the question and then answer uh, the question that you want. Uh, and so what, I, what I'd like to first say is that um, you, you mentioned in your opening statements uh, that the Arab world is, uh, consists of 300 million consumers. Uh, and I immediately took offense to that. Uh, because that, that, yeah, that, that for me... Uh, you have to remember, it came from a financial journalist. <laughs> I, no, I, do. I do remember. Context. Uh, but it did make me think about some of the other ways in which we define ourselves as Arabs. Uh -huh. 
and, and as Muslims. And, you know, when you said consumers, I understand that that is a financial kind of uh, market's approach to, to the Arab world. Uh, you know, the, the, the radicals will um, uh, define uh, our youth as followers and people to be instructed in their faith and to be instructed in how to live their lives. Uh, and, you know, so, some of the uh, more uh, glory-focused uh, uh, men of, of religion will define people as the ummah, to be, to be uh, guided by their great minds. Uh, and I, I would prefer to think of the 300 million Arabs as a bunch of individuals with life plans and with hopes. Uh, and I think, actually, if we, uh, this is part of the book, which is if we focus in on uh, allowing individuals to really flourish in their own right, uh, giving them the, the, the broad guidelines, rather than giving them strict guidelines, broad guidelines based on principle, uh, then we're very much likelier to get the Nobel Prizes, we're very much likelier to get you know, the, the writers and the artists and the creative classes coming out. Good. But let me follow up about the book, uh, Letters to a Young Muslim. This was written to, for your sons that are uh, 16 and 12, but also sending a message, obviously, that should resonate uh, beyond uh, your family, of yeah. course. What prompted you to write it? You thought it was essential in 2017 to suggest uh, the message has been distorted, as Sheikh Mohammed was talking about yesterday? Uh, well, uh, I look back to when I was 15 and the kinds of experiences that I had um, in the mosque and outside of the mosque and, and being able to try to kind of live in the modern world uh, while at the same time being told 7th century, uh, given, given the 7th century conceptual tools with which to analyze the world. Very, very difficult. Uh, and yeah, it, it come, uh, in 2017, 2016, I found that not much progress had been made in trying to bridge the gap between 7th, 10th, and 13th century conceptual uh, 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 apparatus uh, and, and the modern world. And so th what I tried to do was I tried to put myself in the place of a 15-year-old in, in, in the Arab world and the Muslim world today and ask whether the questions that I had had been answered. They hadn't been answered. And so I tried to put my own answer forward. Uh, it is not a, it's not a kind of a, a pedagogical, it's not, uh, uh, it's, I'm not telling people what to do. Um, um, somebody complained that I didn't refer to the Quran with specific verses. Well, the whole point is that really I wanted to uh, structure, maybe orient uh, my son and his generation in a certain way with which to then approach the religious texts, uh, the religious scholars, uh, and authority in general. Cool. Can I add? Absolutely, to that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, I, I think uh, Omar is a spot on when we talk about how do, you, um, how do you deliver religion to children. I think the most important part today that we center, well, our focus is um, to put religious values. I, I think every religion we have, not just Islam, um, and has certain values and spirituality. That's really what religion is to everybody. That's how we were taught as kids. And therefore, you live your life with more values stemmed from your, not only your community, but from your religion as well. And what we see today is sometimes um, curric Islamic cur curriculum has been delivered without the spirituality and the values that are instilled by these religions and specifically Islam. So for, uh, what, we, what we believe in today when you talk to your children, instill that value uh, that comes from religion. All religions talk about not only love of God but love of people, humanity, how you reach out to help others, how do you volunteer in a community. It's all exist in every religious book that we have uh, uh, on, on the world. And therefore, mm -hmm. when you approach religion, do not take it by text and verses, but take the values in it and present it beautifully to the generation that come. That's how their love will be connected to that. Well, in, in fact, uh, you make note of, yes, yeah. great words. That's the moral education that now we are, we are actually introducing in our schools, and our curriculum. That's very crucial to us because I think we, we don't think about it. We take it for granted that it's inherent and it will just transcend to the next generation. It doesn't. Uh, our parents were like that. Okay, let, me, let me test you a little bit. Do you think uh, the society here became a little bit lazy not being more engaged and created a vacuum? for the interpretation of radical Islam. Is that the problem? We assumed that it was being passed to the next generation. And there's a direct link as a former minister of foreign trade and the former minister of economy where economic development, as Sheikh Mohammed made this point yesterday, is not throughout the Islamic world. In fact, is that some of the highest poverty rates in the world rest in the Muslim countries. Absolutely, but I think um, 
a lot of it has to do with how you present Islam, how you talk to the children and the way you deliver it to them. Um, sometimes I think we, uh, we for us, the, the world was much smaller with our parents. There were certain things, we, we did not have a lot of distractions. The dream for us was education, that we can study, we can go abroad, we can come, we'll get a nice job, government will look after us. But the kids of today are independent when they're even five year old. So um, if you have children that can read and they can compare and they can discuss and debate with their parents, then your tools should be different. Mm. And that's really the reality today that you have so many inputs into the child's mind, not yours, but everyone else. And someone can take a verse from religion and then chop it and say, well, this is what it means. So you're falsifying uh, the essence of what religions came for, what humanity uh, means to everybody. So it is important to us as parents Parents, as presidents of the universities, as community, we have to we have to know how we deliver this to the next generations. It's a gener it's a generation that is independent. It is a generation that can stand on its feet and they can learn. They learn fast, but it's a generation that has a creative mind and they are there to pursue future of innovation, and creativity. We have to handle them completely differently than how our parents handled us. A well, powerful message. Uh... Ambassador, you made a That's connection. That's why we have a young ambassador, uh, minister here, minister of youth, that because for us as a responsibility in the government, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed said we have to listen to the youth. Her mandate is to actually bring the community of youth and tell us what they need. Right. So a fair, very fair point. Um, you made a connection between some of the sermons we saw in Turkey before those tragic attacks uh, on New Year's Eve. It was often overlooked in the broader media. Uh, that the sermons were quite radical, quite inspirational for that uh, strand of individual that wanted to go on to the attack. W what do you make of it? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, it's a very important point. And uh, I'm actually very glad that, uh, you know, the sermons in the Emirates, for example, is an example where the government has actually come in and, and spoken to uh, the uh, religious establishment here and said, you know, you've got to really realign yourself with a completely different set of uh, approaches. So, you know, no more of the aggression and the hate, which I remember very clearly in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, and, uh, and that had an effect, you know. It, it actually sent people away from the mosque on Fridays. People would say, I don't want to be uh, uh, on, on a Friday. I don't want to be politicized and, and moved and, and uh, uh, angered uh, by you know, these, these uh, guys who only get to speak once a week, I suppose. Uh, and so, yeah, you go to the mosque these days and you'll find actually there's a very different message. And it shows that um, this is a choice we make, and as a society, it's a choice that we make. Nobody stood and protested the change in the sermons from aggression to uh, positive thinking. Yeah? Uh, and it's something that can happen right across the region. May I ask a, a more sensitive... You, go ahead. Yeah. Um, for the sermons in the UAE... You're adding a lot of analysis. <laughs> this is a, if, you, if you look... Basically, uh, you can do what you want. You don't need to ask. Just give me a second. If you look at the background, is, um, within the UAE, because we, we really didn't have a lot of national sermons in here, yeah. there were quite a lot from abroad, but it um. just happened that people carried their political agenda and their biases with us, with them when they came to the UAE. So the, the sermons for definitely sometimes had given a message that we, we think it's not the right message here because it's, it doesn't really intuit with, with, with our well-being in the UAE and the culture that we have. So the government actually directed the Awqaf here to start looking into a program where they take the sermons here. And now they've gone through this beautiful program where the, and within this program, they told them what the essence of Islam, what are the moral values, and how you present in the mosque. And all of a sudden, you see unified, consistent message that talks more about value than these hatred messages and politicized yeah. messages. And I have a great example when I went to the natural uh, breakfast prayer, I took five people with me. I took uh, three mm. churches, um, St. Andrews and Abu Dhabi. I took the Coptic Church and the Armenian Church from Dubai. And I had two of these uh, uh, advisors, actually, and they were young. They were in their 20s. And they spoke beautifully to our youth, the university kids uh, in, in uh, Washington, D.C., about how they value. And they told them, 
go back to the truth. There are a lot of fatwas right now. There are, there are actually databases within the UAE and Al-Azhar as well where it defies this, uh, this uh, negative rhetoric uh, that is um, very uh, anti-other uh, you know, uh, um, uh, nations. So it's being uh, bold enough is what you're suggesting. Yes, we're taking no, a courageous bold, yeah, that, that. Took it, because what it is is we believe in Islam and we, we know what Islam is all about. But what we see today is not Islam. Islam has been hijacked. So for us, it's the only way to do it is you need to divert it back to the roots, to the grassroots. And the best way to do it is to start by the sermons. And, the, and now you see a complete different aspect of mosque and what they deliver. And, and to add to it, I, I have seen programs where even these sermons will go and talk on volunteer basis with students at schools. So now they start to create this love for religion to the children by bringing people who can actually speak the truth. Good. The prayer breakfast, I think, is a good launching off point to look at uh, the very quite radical populism that we see in the United States. We saw the vote, I suggested in my opening remarks, with Brexit. Uh, Marie Le Pen potentially uh, giving a good run for the money as uh, president of, of France today. What's happening? What's the interpretation here? If we want to put up the wall to Muslim countries? You had the travel ban against seven countries? I think that in itself had created a lot of animosity within the states and worldwide. We've seen the protests that have taken place. But if you, we can't look at that in isolation. I think this, um, this rising uh, populism is happening worldwide. And there are deep-rooted reasons for that. And I think Christine Lagarde spoke about it yesterday, that while we actually shifted, it's almost like a pendulum that goes from one swing to the other side. Yeah, and it always, overshoots. Uh, right yeah, there. and what you need to do is you always push it back to the middle. And what's happening worldwide is while we have globalization, and the idea of this is access to market, where you benefit, we have seen uh, the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. So there's now a, a wealth divide. And this wealth divide created a lot of negative sentiments, including the US. And um, within this, is a lot of it is people saying, well, the jobs are not there uh, anymore. But the, the true message of this is not about, I lost my job for another country. There is a rising technology change, it's disruptive technology today that's changing the world and it's taking it in a whirlwind. Today, you see robotics. And, and the way you see artificial intelligence. Um, when I was in DC, I went to visit the uh, children's hospital there. And I was amazed. This is this, the research center that UAE actually sponsored about $150 million. This particular uh, center, I was looking at robotics where they do um, surgery for children, where it has the, the more, probably the, the least invasive surgery mm. where the children can recover. Um, you see artificial with 3D printers where they're looking into tissues of human being eventually where they can actually print human tissues. So the technologies out there had changed the map of the world. So when, when I look at this from the um, global perspective, the change is happening. Everything is changing around us and we need to be prepared for that. But when we talk about the Muslim ban, I think the, the thoughts, I mean, this is a sovereignty issue within the U.S. In, in terms of demanding what they want, whether the intent of this was actually to defer uh, terrorism from the U.S., maybe the way it was delivered, the message was not, not really the right message. And we have seen the, the backtrack of this now with the U.S. government where they're looking at this to really put the right articulation for the ban itself. Are you talking about those so-called judges that made that interpretation? <laughs> <laughs> Three to zero? The so-called judges? I'm not sure where they uh, came from. I don't but. know where the so-called comes from. <laughs> from the president himself. <laughs> go, uh, Ambassador, go ahead. I, I think there's a, a great deal of focus on the Muslim ban, uh, and perhaps, perhaps too much. Uh, I think, you know, if we look in the region, many countries in the region also place bans on similar countries. Uh, so we shouldn't be particularly surprised. Uh, but the more interesting element for us to, I think, look at is the way in which the American Constitution is demonstrating that it actually works. Hmm. And there was a big question uh, as to whether this was permissible or not. And I think that's actually much more interesting to see that, you know, you can have a president who wants to, wants to do fairly radical things on his own, in his own right and represent a nationalist populist position. Uh, and he's being prevented. 
And I think that's really quite fascinating. And if we think about our societies and our, our political systems, perhaps we can learn also from that. Uh, that you know, the, the, the idea of uh, constitutional law is not just a myth, it's not just an ideology and, and, and propaganda. It is actually something that can be seen to work in very volatile situations. Well, as an American, I would say it's, it's straining our system of checks and balances, but it, to your point, it is working. And in fact, link it back to your point uh, earlier, uh, that investors were looking to see if the system would hold up with the radical challenge. Now, you made a very interesting point about uh, globalization, because I have a premise that we had the fall of communism, 89, 90, the lowering of trade barriers in 92, and the creation of the World Trade Organization, and then the revolution of digital uh, economy, 1995 and, and onward. What influences has it had on your, if you will, your home market of Russia? How are they interpreting radical Islam today? This real push to globalization and then this push for nationalism, which has been present, uh, present rather, in Russia as well. Yeah, I'm not sure that they're uh, succeeding in their globalization strategy, given all the sanctions that have been placed on that. Uh, so actually what's happening now is that they're developing their economy internally. So there is now a lobby within Russia that is in favor of keeping sanctions in place because it, they have a captive market. You know, the, the beef industry has started up. You know, uh, Parmesan cheese is now produced in Russia, uh, and various kind of uh, um, Italian uh, alcohols are also produced there. So you know, in, in that sense, you know, globalization has had a kind of a negative effect, right? You know, you're either part of the system, you're not. Um, uh, in, in terms of kind of the, their approach to radical Islam, you have to remember about 18% of Russia is, uh, is Muslim. Uh, and I've you know, interacted with quite a number of them. Uh, and they are uh, aggressive, interesting. Uh, they have a very clear sense of their own identity. Um, and uh, they are very also radicalized. I mean, a large number of them are playing a role in, in ISIS and in Syria and Iraq. Uh, so the Russians are looking at this from a historical perspective of a difficult relationship with uh, Islam going back almost 300 years. Uh, and so I think, you know, it's, for, for them it's not a surprise that there, there are these radical elements, and they uh, come down on them very, very firmly. So they believe in the iron fist approach. Yeah, in, in fact, I was going to ask you, if we had this conversation even three years from now, is it going to change? A lot of people say we sit here and we use the UAE model and the interpretation of Islam and tolerance and the connection to youth and the connection of happiness. Is it going to get much worse in the next three years because of this nationalist and populist fervor that we see today, Sheikh Alubna? I hate um, pessimistic <laughs> thoughts. To me, I'm an optimist. And I, I think um, we should move from being defensive toward Islam by being firm, by being positive, by sending out the right message, um, by being out there. I think 50% of the challenge happens when you sit there and you confront this and you look at solutions. You think, what is it that we should be doing? If we have the right message here, this is a society that has 200 nationality. It's a Muslim society. We have others living here. So who talks about Islam? This is a Muslim society. We have a good example. This is a, a society that others can look at and we, they can see and look at the success um, of things happening in here. But three years from now, to me, much more crucial than that is if we want societies, Muslim societies, to move forward or even other societies, we need to tap into the wealth of the youth. Today, uh, if you talk about um, Nobel laureates or we talk about patents maybe 15, 20 years ago, the, the age range was different. We're, we're getting into a phase now, a decade, where the patents and the geniuses are 15-year-old and 17-year-olds. So when we look at society, in order to reduce the negative rhetoric, you need to tap into building and, and contributing to the, to the well-being of the youth. So you look at it by creating the right programs, you look at innovation, you encourage them, you see the business models that actually can leap these kids and have them in the forefront. Today, the guys who make the mega bucks in the U.S. are the uh, younger ones; they're not the old ones. You know, the the uh, modus operandi of creating wealth is no longer real estate. And uh, you you look at kids with certain technology, and and you just need one application, and and the the wealth changes immediately the minute you look into the maps. Today, you look at Facebook. Facebook people look at it and they call or Twitter. This is a nation by itself. It's like a universe mm -hmm. of its own. So we need to think in that line. And then 
for tolerance programs or looking at any values, we need to bring this as the essence of it and build with it. But you can't build this in isolation without really, without not looking at the reality of what's happening as we go forward. Good. We're knocking uh, at the end of our time together, but I wanted to give you one question, the same question to both of you, and I'll start with the ambassador and have you finish up. I, I thought it was fascinating yesterday because it was a discussion about uh, Arab revitalization, and Sina Sheikh Mohammed said, this is the model we have. I'm not going to imprint it on you. And I, I'm open to all different formulas, but he didn't want to impose it. Do other countries rise to the occasion here for the greater Middle East and North Africa and actually come up with different formulas or embracing the formula that works today? Because poverty is part of what we're discussing. First, Ambassador Gobash, and then uh, Sheikh Lubna, if you can wrap it. We have, sure. Let's give you a minute each, and then we'll okay. close. Okay. Thank you. I may take less time. Uh, I, the way I look at it is that uh, we do have an amazing model in the Emirates, uh, but I, uh, I, I would be personally interested in understanding how it is that it came about. Uh, and I know that there are many fantastic initiatives taking place, but the, the theory behind it, the understanding, the principles that are actually uh, at, at work, is something that we really need to think about, or at least some of us should be thinking about, so that when uh, you know, the Libyans turn up here and want advice on how to do it, then we can actually explain it to them, and we can actually help them kind of localize uh, success in a, in a Libyan environment. Environment. Um, if I speak about my government here, we walk the talk, we lead by example. So if you want to influence others, bring the positive contagion of your whatever initiative that you have. And UAE has a history of this. Um, people defied us. Dubai Ports Authority and the fear that take, had taken place, if you remember, I was, right in, the, right? I was in yeah. the midst of it. I was just appointed as Minister of Economy. And at That's the time, before we met and you were doing an interview with Wolf Blitzer trying to explain it all. <laughs> and if you look at that time when people said, wait a minute, this is a Muslim country. He's going to rule the world. Look where Dubai world today. Yeah. Look at the highest building here in Dubai, Burj Khalifa. Who would have thought this would be built in a Muslim Arab world? So Everything people told us you can't do, we said we can. So it's the attitude of His Highness, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, who says, take the positive attitude, a can-do attitude, move forward, and people want to move with us, then that's fine. And the most specific part to me that resonates in my ear is it's like a running river. Time is an, a, a, an essence here. You go forward. You don't have a pause button or a Microsoft um, delete or undo. Mm. So watch your time, move forward, because if you're not, you know, you're not behind. <laughs>